The Place, New York City. The time, February 17th and 18th of 1996. In the mid-1990s, New York really had, you know, more events than anywhere else. You know, we created this destination where people could come and it was really, I, I, I don't mean it as a pun, it was really magical. Going to Magic Terms before Nutri Ground was all about going to the hotel, the hotel conference rooms. People wanted to, you know, play in Brian's tournaments. You know, he ran the biggest and best tournaments back then. There's something unbelievable about finding people who are like you. Here at Magic's testing facility, gameplay technicians simulate every possible battle. Discovering Magic was this random treasure trove of awesomeness and possibility. We'd never seen anything like it. In the mid-1990s, a brand new game called Magic the Gathering spread like wildfire among gamers around the world. When the battles on kitchen tables and in small stores could no longer satisfy Magic's most enthusiastic players, an overwhelming demand for something greater emerged. And so the mages of New York City created the infrastructure for something fantastic and new, regular large-scale tournaments. When we first all got involved with Magic in my comic book community, um, a group of us were really interested in what we could do with Magic, how could we um, continue to inhabit the game. And one of the ways we discovered was that we could run tournaments. Brian David Marshall's role in Organized Magic, he's like the founding godfather. You know, he just wanted and figured out ways to run tournaments. He knew people wanted to compete. He was a Magic player. Brian David Marshall basically invented the Magic tournament. He was young enough that he just didn't know he wasn't supposed to do certain things. So he did stuff like print out a bunch of flyers, get people to come someplace, and come up with outlandish formats that we would never do today. Five star melee sealed. Grand melee was a huge one. Then we had Anaconda starter deck melee draft. Brian ran these thousand dollar tournaments out of the New Yorker hotel. There would be like a big thousand dollar tournament, you know, a couple times a month. Um, you know, and in those days, that was sort of, you know, as big as it gets. With the demand for more tournaments growing every day, Magic players up and down the East Coast began flocking to a large loft space on the ninth floor of a Chelsea high-rise. In the spirit of fair competition, the founders called their game store Neutral Ground. Neutral Ground was a uh, community of diverse people uh, who came together to play games that they loved. I opened Neutral Ground in 1995 with my partners, my wife. Uh, we wanted to find a way to channel all the energy we were seeing at our magic conventions. At this point, uh, there was no real magic community. Everyone just played with their group of friends. Uh, you know, everyone would just buy the cards, you know, oh, I'm gonna teach you how to play, let's make up some rules, let's figure some stuff out. Neutral Ground was just so much bigger than just the game store. It was the place where a lot of tournaments and ideas for Tournament Magic, you know, for, first came up. It was a place where young misfits who didn't fit in anywhere else could meet with other young misfits in a time when they didn't have access to things like the internet and meetups and forums for support. I loved going there and pretty soon I was going there every day. And on the weekend sometimes, I would literally, you know, be like, well, what's the point of my like going home? So I would walk over to Penn Station and I would just sleep at Penn Station you know, and then come back at noon when it would open up again. You know, I probably saw the Penn Station, you know, a few dozen times. Prior to Neutral Ground, there, there wasn't such a thing as a tournament center. We wanted to create a place for people to prove themselves. Right now, we're behind the Puck Building. Uh, the Puck Building's in Lower Manhattan, and it was the site of the very first Pro Tour. I actually top aided. Uh, but I lost in the quarterfinals. In 1996, Wizards of the Coast hosted the most prestigious competition in Magic's young history. In searching for a host city where the excitement could live up to the magnitude of the event, it's no surprise that Magic's first Pro Tour was conceived in New York City. Hello Magic fans and welcome to the final match of the first ever 1996 professional tournament for Magic the Gathering. The moment there was a Pro Tour, we started treating magic as serious business. It was 
something we would play for hours and hours on end, and we would have tournaments and competitions, and we would treat the tournaments as serious business when we're in them. We didn't treat magic in general as serious business. When the first Pro Tour was announced and invitations went out, it was a huge deal. First question, of course, was, can I play? Everyone wanted to play. But that first Pro Tour, you couldn't compete for a slot. You had to call in for a slot. They had a few they gave to, uh, you know, I think a prior world champion, you know, European players, things like that. It was like a radio call-in show, you know, 100th caller gets free tickets. You know, you, you got through, you got invited to the Pro Tour. Looks like uh, Lakanto's got this wrapped up. Wow, wow, there, there is, I cannot think of anything Lestre can do. Lakanto looks like he's going to be. Yep. Yep, that's it. He, yep, that's it. He, uh, straight can seize the match. Michael Lacanto of Boston, Massachusetts has just become the first winner of the pro tournament. Excellent. Wow, Very, look at it. There they are. There. Uh... Let me find one of my favorite pieces of magic paraphernalia. Goes back to remember when I was a kid playing magic at neutral ground. But this is my old Spin Magazine article. Okay. And uh, this has got a story about, I think mostly what it was like to play magic in general, but also what it was like to play magic in New York. Oh, there's Annie DeFranco. Me and Annie, you know, we, I feel like, you know, I have to listen to her music now. I think the first pro tour in New York really legitimized, you know, the New York magic scene. But I don't even know what year this was. I'm thinking, yeah, August 1997, that's what I thought. I was uh, 16 when they did this. The yeah, teen nerd boy craze. Mm -hmm. Now if they only knew how big it was and how many people play magic. I think after the first Pro Tour, we started to realize you needed to develop a team of people, a team of people around you who was serious about playing magic, serious about testing. And I think that's why, you know, me and John, while well, we first started, you know, playing together, you know, and then we became very close friends. But that kind of idea of we need to play with the best to be the best is really what first, you know, drew us to start testing together. All right, I definitely have a Neutral Ground t-shirt around here somewhere. Uh, you know, we had tons of those. I think I have it right here. This was the Neutral Ground shirt. It's a little well-worn and loved. Uh, neutral Ground closed in 2008, uh, but that was under different ownership. Uh, for me, uh, Neutral Ground uh, ended uh, around 2001, 2002. I think that Neutral Ground's legacy is probably in the players who came through our doors. Creating a place where uh, John Finkel and Zvi Moshewitz and Steve OMS and Chris Bakula and Dave Price, and obviously those guys are super smart and they would have been fine no matter what, but I, I like to think that uh, Neutral Ground provided a place for them to, uh, I don't know, to prosper. Look, to this day, I don't know whether or not this story is true. But there was one day a year that Neutral Ground would close, and that was Christmas Day. Literally open 364 other days a year. I was just hanging out as late as possible because we're Jewish. Where am I going to go? It's Christmas weekend. And they didn't realize I was there, and they locked up, and they left. And this is before we all had cell phones. And Sean McEwen was our manager who opened on Boxing Day. And he opens the elevator door, which opened right into neutral ground. And as soon as he opens the door, according to Sean, Zvi Moshewitz barrels past him into the elevator, starts jamming the lobby button, and the elevator descends. And he's like, what the heck? So I didn't have a way to let them know that I was there. So I'm just alone in the store. And then he hears a sound. And the, the alarms are still on. The motion detector is still, so he has to go, he disarms the alarm. And then they come in finally and they open the door and then I just run out. And he's like, what the heck just happened? How, was Zvi locked in neutral ground from Christmas Eve to the day after Christmas with the motion detector and the alarm still operating? He's like, that's crazy. So I'm just there for several days. I'm just there. But, and it's annoying because it, there's no one to play with. Everyone's gone. But, and this is what he tells us, and then he goes behind the counter 
and he finds like this little area that apparently Zvi had camped out in, out of sight of the alarms. I, I have some practice fasting, so not eating for a bit was no sweat off my back. And there's three piles. There's a pile of candy wrappers, there's a pile of magic wrappers, and there's a pile of cash to pay for the first two piles. To this day, I have no idea whether or not this is true. <laughs>